Kevin Wallace is a powerful, powerful man of God. He's got a powerful church in Chattanooga. And uh, I remember going there, I think it was a few months back with pastor. Pastor said, hey, come on with me over this way. And he was going to preach that night. Well, the Spirit of God broke out in that place, and I saw young people go after God in a way that I have never seen it anywhere I've been. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. And then the next day, I heard that it went on till 4 o'clock in the afternoon or something. I mean, the Spirit of the Lord just powerfully broke out in that place. But... Hey, you're going to love him. He's a voice in this hour. Pastor has so much confidence in him. And I want you to stand to your feet and give a big, warm welcome to Kevin Wallace. God bless. Come on, let's give Jesus more praise than that. Come on, come on, come on. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, there's nobody like him. There's nobody greater. There's not a name that's higher. There's not a God that's any more powerful. How many believe Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? If you love him, notify your face. Tell your hands to clap. Tell your mouth to shout. Command your soul to praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath in this building give him the best praise. You've given him all morning long. Hallelujah. I stand here honored today to be with you. Just remain standing. We're going to the Word together. I am humbled and honored to be here uh, and for Pastor to ask me to come for one night was indeed a privilege and a high honor for him, ask, for him to ask me to come and stay and minister on Friday morning. I was just overwhelmed and then I got here and he told me about his tooth and I said, oh, He's going to leave. I know what that means. I know that feeling, and I'm just wanting to be a very good steward of the pulpit this morning. I will be on my best behavior, and I brought more of a statesman anointing with me today. So it's going to... If you were here last night, you know what I'm talking about. Can I visit with you just a moment before we go to 1 Kings chapter 21? I wanted to put my family picture up on the screen. Um, there's my crew. And, yeah. So let me, let me give you a lowdown real quick. On the left is my eldest son. He lives in Washington, D.C. with his beautiful wife, Michelle. He works for American First Policy Institute. He's called into government. I love Jeremiah. Next to him is Judah Mariah. She's a singer and a lover of the presence of God. In my lap is Asher Wallace. To my left there and your right is my beautiful bride, the jam in my jelly roll, the bee of my hive, the honey in my biscuit, Devin Wallace, and she is holding my baby girl, Genesis Amaya Wallace. To her left is my oldest daughter, Zion Isabella, and to her left is my youngest son, Isaiah Wallace. I am blessed. My quiver is full. Don't come up and talk to me and prophesy about more children. I got all the children I need and all the children I want. Hallelujah. The Lord's been good to me. I want to tell you this, though. That Can you go back to that picture? I just felt led to, 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 to say this as I jump in. Um, the precious baby in my lap and the precious baby girl in my wife's lap, uh, Devin and I have not been quiet regarding the issue of life in America. I preach that children ought to live. And we need to value life in America. And I celebrated and shouted all over my church the morning Roe versus Wade was overturned for this nation. I'm not ashamed to tell you I lost people when I took a stand for life, but I would do it all over again. Because at the end of the day, I'm not here to please a crowd. I'm here to hear, hear a well done, good and faithful servant. But I want to tell you this. I have preached and I have fasted. We have prayed and we have decreed and declared the word of the Lord that Roe v. Wade would be overturned. But the church has got to do more than scream about abortion. The church needs to get a spirit of adoption. I'm going to tell you what happened. That precious baby girl sitting in my wife's lap was a child that was given birth to by a precious 14-year-old young lady who was told, have an abortion. 
She called Deb and we have an agency that helps resource young ladies who are in human trafficking and those who have gotten pregnant don't want to have a child and Devin and her team helped those women and this precious grandmother called the office and she was calling on behalf of her 14 year old granddaughter who was pregnant during COVID with Genesis and, and, and there were people in her family that told her to have an abortion. Her grandmother's born again. She said, you can't have an abortion. You got to have this baby. She put us in touch with that child. I was flying home from North Carolina preaching. When I landed, my wife had left me a message trembling and crying. She said, I just met with a 14-year-old girl who's 36 weeks pregnant, and the Holy Ghost told me she's carrying our baby. And I got back up in the airplane and went back to North Carolina. I'm old enough to be a papa. I'm 43 years old, and, and uh, I, did, I thought I had exercised all my dad muscles. I certainly have a dad body, amen. And. Um, Watch this, watch this. That 14-year-old girl gave birth to Genesis. Devin and I adopted her and held her for the first time. The moment she was born, the first hands that held her were my wife's. We took her home, and she's been ours ever since the day she was born. That 14-year-old girl had a 28-year-old mother trapped in a life of prostitution, had had nine abortions. She got pregnant with her 10th child, and her pimp said, you're going to have him aborted. That 14-year-old girl told that 28-year-old mama, if you'll have this baby, I know a preacher's family that will take care of it. Now, she didn't talk to me or my secretary about that. But I want you to know that Devin met with that 28-year-old lady. We rescued that young lady for a season from a life that was trapped in addiction and in bondage, put her in a safe place. She had Asher, Isaac Asher Wallace, who I'm holding in my lap in that picture. He should have been and was about to be the 10th aborted child. He is the single most treasured, sweetest, happiest baby. His name is Isaac Asher. Isaac means happiness. Asher means joy, double joy. That's who he is. And let me tell you something. Both of them are a testimony to a culture that has devalued life and has somehow prioritize sexual pleasure, and it's crazy what's going on in this nation, but the church is about to do more than preach sermons against abortion. We're about to put, mm -hmm. we're about to put the devil in his place and raise a generation of children who were almost aborted, and they're gonna rise up to be voices of life, voices of breakthrough, the greatest singers, the greatest preachers, the greatest politicians, the greatest bankers, the, come on in here, church, that this nation has ever seen is about to come through the womb of a young lady who the enemy said, get rid of it, and God said, you can't. I've got a plan for their life. I wish I had somebody to help me praise the Lord in this church for what he's doing in this day. We're living in unprecedented times. And so I wanted you to see my family. I'm blessed and thankful, and, and I'm grateful to be here. And I want you to go with me to 1 Kings 21 while you're standing, and I'm going to read some scripture this morning and share what I feel like the Lord. For a few minutes, we're going to jump from 1 Kings 21. I don't intend to, uh, like Elizabeth Taylor told her eighth husband, I'm not going to hold you long. <laughs> oh, my. If my humor anointing comes out, y'all are all in trouble. <laughs> First Kings chapter 21, when you have it, say amen. amen. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, amen. you look eight pounds lighter this year than you did last year. Come on. You look better. You're looking trim and slim. It's fantastic. Verse 1 reads, and it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, say vineyard. vineyard. The vineyard was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near next to my house and for it I will give you a vineyard better than it or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. 
And he laid down on his bed and turned with a wave with his face and wouldn't eat no food. But Jezebel. The devil with a skirt on. But don't get nervous because I've seen Jezebel in three-piece suits. Jezebel is not a woman. Jezebel is a demon. We'll get there. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, Where is, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, Because I have spoken to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And I want to preach for a few moments today on this thought. This vineyard is not for sale. Turn around and tell three or four people in your area code there, say, this vineyard is not for sale. Anybody got a vineyard? This vineyard is not for sale. Let's pray for each other this morning. Holy Ghost, we need you. Make a big ado about Jesus today. May his kingdom be advanced, his word pierced like a sword. I thank you for the anointing that breaks the yoke. I thank you for the integrity and the authenticity of the word of God. I pray today that it would have free course in this room. And I pray in Jesus' name like a hot knife cutting through butter that the sword of the Lord, the word of God, will cut asunder today and that our hearts would be circumcised by the word that you would let us leave this place renewed in our vigor, in our expectation, strengthen us in our faith. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is revealing and saying to the church in this hour. In Jesus' name and the family of God said amen. amen. You can be seated. As of March this year, I have been doing ministry for 20 years. In fact, I'm currently on a month-long sabbatical while I'm preaching for you. My family is down at the beach, and I canceled everything else I had on my calendar, but I said I'm not canceling Church of His Presence or John Kilpatrick. I'm going to go down. And my church, my church sent me on that break for these 20 years and said, Pastor, just go take some rest. Spend a month with your family, refresh, refocus, and we want you to get ready because we feel like there's a fresh season coming. We want you to be ready and rested and prepared for that, and I'm grateful for that. And after 20 years of ministry, a person might think, well, he's sort of found his niche and gotten his, you know, hands around what what he's up to and what God is doing in his life, where God is taking him. But I want to confess something to you. After 20 years, I'm as much a student and a discoverer of what God is doing and what God is saying. And I don't know about you. I never want to guess I've got some more mileage on the tire and I've learned some lessons. But at the end of the day, we can never stop being hungry for God. And we can never think that we've come to a place in ministry where we've arrived and we cannot be taught. Because God is never, God is never simply uh, limited in his methodology. The message never changes, but methods do change. Strategies and structures given birth to by the Holy Spirit have been downloaded into today's church because the church of today cannot live on yesterday's oil. And, and as I have been doing this thing in ministry for 20 years and, and just in a constant state of discovery and learning, uh, because I feel like there are new complexities and layers and issues that we're dealing with and things that we're wrestling with, I don't know about any other minister in this room, and perhaps today I'm speaking more to ministers than just anyone else, but there are things that we're dealing with, questions that we are being asked, situations we are struggling through, things that we are wrestling with that we've never had to wrestle before in the ministry. 
How, how, how do we do certain things? How, how do we proceed through unchartered territory? And that is one reason why I find it especially refreshing when I come to a moment where God makes something very simple, succinct, and easily known. I, I, I have learned to appreciate when God makes things very, very easy to understand. With all the challenges and all the complexities, I am grateful for the things in my life that God makes very, very known to me. And there are some things that God has made known that we don't need to overcomplicate or unnecessarily make it difficult. We need to embrace what God has made known to us in a season where identity is being challenged and where people are trying to thwart and to twist and manipulate and wrest the word of God and the truth of God. We need to, we need to be thankful when God makes it very, very well known what we are to be up to. And there are some things that God has made very clear to the people of God. I could talk about a lot of those. I'm, I'm only assigned to talk about this fact and reality. I am absolutely convinced when I read the word of God, God makes it very clear from Genesis to, to Revelation that we are people of the wine. I do not mean your alcoholic beverages. I am talking about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And if you came today to get permission to do something that you know is wrong, you found the wrong preacher because I believe what Paul said in Ephesians 5, be not drunk with wine wherein it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I'm not going to participate, I'm not going to preach on this because I know some people get nervous, but I'm not going to participate in something that is m nothing more than a replica of the real thing. I don't need, some people drink bud, but they don't get any wiser. So today when I preach about the wine, I'm not talking about giving you permission to go and drink alcoholic beverage. I'm going to run from that because there is a fountain filled with blood flowing from Emmanuel's veins. And I don't need a cheap replica or a copy of something that is absolutely divine and can be released to those who hunger for it. When I preach about the wine today, I want to be very clear. I am talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit. We are not domesticated Pentecostals who have learned how to tame and tamper down the outpouring of the power. This is the supernatural power of God we're talking about. We are not talking about a God who can be trifled with. He doesn't sit up on your chimney mantle. You cannot put him in a photo and hang him on your wall and talk to him when you pass by. This is the God who sits on the circle of the earth, whose eyes go to and fro. He holds the mountains in the palm of his hand and the valleys and the oceans in a span. There is nobody like him. No one can advise him. No one can suggest to him. No one can counsel him. He does not have a birthday. He is not old. He is not aging. He is not tired. Neither does he grow weary. This is not a God who has eyes that cannot see and ears but cannot hear. This is not a God who has a mouth but cannot speak. This is not even a God who has hands but cannot move. The prophet Isaiah said the ear of the Lord is not too heavy that it cannot hear him. And the arm of the Lord is not too short that it cannot save. We are talking about a living, alive, breathe. He is a powerful, awesome, untouchable, nobody like him kind of God. And he did not call us to be a people who just sort of blend in with a culture. The Apostle Peter said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You should show forth and I should show forth the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I want to tell you something. There is something qualifiably, quantifiably different about the redeemed. I don't think I'm better than the lost humanity that's walking the streets of this city. I think I'm better than the old man that I used to be because of Jesus and the power of his spirit that is living on the inside of me. I hope today we wake up from the, from the nightmare that has become so much of what the modern church is pursuing that somehow it is just about singing a few songs, hearing a great sermon, 
and then our life is more defined by the job we have than the king that we serve I want to tell you today he didn't save you just everyone stand up quickly please turn around and put your hand on your pew Turn around and put your hand on where you were sitting. Do you feel that warm spot? That is not your contribution to the kingdom of God. You and I were not called to get saved and warm pews till Jesus comes. That's why they call it a pew. If you sit there long enough, it begins to stink. At some point, you have to be invaded and invigorated and touched by the power that raised the dead body of Jesus from the grave. And I came to incite in someone today and to remind you, you are not a domesticated, defeated bunch of people hoping that Jesus bails us out while the Antichrist is ruling and reigning. We are not going to heaven hiding in a cave. We are not crossing over saying farther along. We'll know all about it. When we cross the finish line, my head will not be dripping down. My head will be lifted high saying, look what the Lord has done. Slap your neighbor. Tell them we are people of victory. We are people of victory. We are not people who are hoping so. We are people who are serving the living God. And the same spirit that raised his dead body up from the tomb is moving across this room right now. Move, Holy Spirit. Please be seated. We are people of the wine. We should have known we are people of the wine. He tried to show us. All the way back in the book of Numbers. He sent 12 spies into the promised land. He said, I want you to go look into the promised land. I just brought you out of Egypt, but I didn't bring you out to let you sit soaking sour. I'm bringing you out of Egypt to take you into a promised land. He said, I want you to go spy the land. Tell me what you see. And you know the story, Numbers 13. They go into the land and what do they bring back with them? A cluster of grapes from the valley of Eskol that were so huge they had to drape it over a stick and two men had to carry it out of the... Somebody say grapes. Why in the world is it significant that they brought out grapes? They could have brought out apples. They could have brought out oranges. They could have brought out any, but they brought out grapes. Why? Because the promised land is going to be a land where wine can be found. We should have known that we're people of the wine. The first miracle Jesus ever did is he went to a place called Cana. And during a, f a wedding in which he was attending, the Bible says in the second chapter of John's gospel that they ran out of wine. And they went to Jesus and said, we've run out of wine. And Mary looks at the disciples and says, whatever Jesus tells you to do, just do it. Why don't you tell your neighbor this morning, just elbow your neighbor and say, whatever he says, do. Come on, talk to him like you love him. Say, whatever he says, do. Do it. Do it. We don't have time for delayed obedience. We don't have time to measure it out. We don't have time to think it through. We don't have time to process it. I'm not interested in a vote from the, from the committee who takes a vote to see if the vote is going to be in harmony. It's time to obey the word of the Lord. We've run out of wine, and you can't have a wedding, and intimacy cannot happen until you have some wine. You know the story, he filled six stone pots with water. It went in water, but it came out wine. And they began to drink that wine at the end of the wedding and everybody's mind was blown because the, the taste of the wine was so wonderful that they said, what is this? Most of the time when you come to a wedding, you have the best at the first and as the night wears on, they have the worst wine to come out, but somehow or another, for some reason we can't explain this wedding is different. How many know this wedding is different? I said, how many know this wedding is different? That's why I'm not worried about the generation I'm living in. Yes, there's a lot of craziness. Yes, there's a lot of foolishness. Yes, there's a lot of demonic activity. Yes, there is sexual perversion. Yes, there are laws that are being passed that do not line up with the word of God. But at the end of the day, I got peace. Do you know why? Because he saves the best for last. And I want to tell you right now, if hell is howling and hissing, if it looks like hell's winning, you better check the scoreboard again before you walk 
to your car and go home to eat lunch, you better tell yourself and notify the devil that we win. Don't you let any false prophet stand up and tell you that we're going to lose. Greater is he that is in me than the one that's living in this world. People of the wine. We should have known we're people of the wine. Because when the church is birthed and the revelation of the redeemed is fully revealed in Acts 2, the church is not inaugurated with a bunch of arrogant, proud theologians who come out in their garb and in their robes and religious piety saying this is Pentecost. No, when the church is birth, it looks like a bunch of drunk people. Y'all don't like this. I can tell by looking at some of you right now. You're looking at me like, is he really going to go there? Oh, we're going there today. Because I think one of the f most fantastic realities of Pentecost is that there are times I feel you, Holy Spirit, and I'm thankful for what I feel. There are times when we walk to our car and forgot where we parked. There are times when we lay on the floor and lose track of time. There are times when we speak in tongues and people look at us and they say they've lost their mind. No, I tell you what, I did lose my mind and I got the mind of Christ and it gives me joy unspeakable and full of glory. And some of us are listening to the wrong voices and they're telling us just chill out, sit down, get back to a formula. The only formula I want is the one that the church was birthed in. Give me the Holy Spirit. Give me tongues of fire. Give me wind that blows through the house and, and clothing tongues that sit on each of us. I'm telling you if you want to knock the rebellion out of the rebellious, if you want to knock the alcohol out of the alcoholic, if you want to knock the, the, the thieving out of the thief, you need more than a clergy shirt and a bottle of oil. You need the Holy Ghost to come into the church if we're going to preach till people get healed, if we're going to preach and pray till people get delivered, we need more of the wine of the Holy Spirit. Someone shout for 12 seconds and praise God the Father. Praise God the Son. Praise God the Holy Ghost. We are people of the wine. I was raised around a bunch of spiritual drunks. Don't feel sorry for me. <laughs> Little hole in this church. We prayed before church every time we had church. We had a prayer meeting before we had a worship service. I was 15, 14, 15, 16 years old. And God was starting to help me and use me and touch my life. I'd play the drums. I'd sing. Every now and then they'd let me testify. <laughs> And when God started touching my life, they'd say, now you need to come to prayer meeting. Okay. And I'd go to prayer meeting. We were holiness people. The men prayed on the left in a room and the women prayed on the right. I'd go in that room with the men and they'd start rocking. I'm 14, 15 years old. I got, I'm in high school. I got friends. If they knew I was rocking, I'd, oh my God, they would talk about me. But I'm in church on Sunday night. It's 515 rocking and those men start praying and start wailing and start praying in an unknown tongue. I didn't know what was going on, but I caught it. Somewhere in my 15th year of life, I caught it. I was singing I Fly Away. Some of you don't know that old song. It's page 333 in the red back. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. And one Sunday afternoon at a prayer meeting, I stopped singing in English and I started singing in an unknown tongue. And when I came to, those men had hands laid on me and I didn't even know where I was or where I was going, but I hadn't... I had never felt that kind of joy. I'm telling you, ever since that night, I pulled up to uh, the, the, the winery of heaven. I have 
never ceased coming back for another drink because it gives me joy unspeakable. Oh, I'm going to preach in here this morning and full of glory. You need to hear what I'm about to tell you. The kingdom of God is not bondage, depression, and oppression. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. One third, one third of the expression of the kingdom of God is an expression of joy. If you don't have joy, you're not as delivered as you ought to be. You are to have joy unspeakable. Joy in the face of the adversary. Joy in the middle of the fire. Joy in the middle of the storm. Joy knowing that no weapon formed against us. My God, somebody take a joy praise break in this church on Friday morning. We're people of the wine. Please be seated. Hallelujah. People of the wine. I'll never forget being with those men and women praying. One night we had a foot wash. I don't know why I'm telling you all this story. It feels good to tell it. We were having a foot washing one night. Men, again, we're holding this, people. Men washing feet on the left. When I think we thought feet were going to turn somebody on. If you get turned on by somebody's foot, you need deliverance. There went the statesman. <laughs> Laugh! <laughs> Joy. We were having a foot washing. The men were on the left, the women were on the right. We had an organ player growing up named Brother Tommy Watts. He had false teeth, nothing wrong with that, except he didn't glue his. He was singing one night, playing the organ, and in the middle of a song he was singing, his teeth flew out in the middle of hallelujah. And when, I promise you, I saw it, it happened like this. He said, holly, and when he said holly, his teeth flew out, he threw them back in and said, Luya. Shouted all over the church. His wife was Sister Pat. Sister Pat had hair, hair down to the floor. She could play, this is a true story before the Lord, maracas in her left hand, a tambourine in her right hand, and she had a head harmonica holder. And it looked like this. And when the Holy Ghost would hit her, her hair would fall in front of her face, and all you could see was the harmonica and a big pile of hair. It looked like Cousin It playing the harmonica. One night we were having a football. I have no clue why I'm telling you this story except to tell you it's what I was born in. It's the vineyard I was raised in. I saw the sick killed. I saw the blind eye open. I saw the lame leg. You came too late to tell me we're crazy. I tell you I serve a God who's able to deliver. A God who's able to heal. A God who's able to save. And you come too late to tell me he can't. He is not just a God who was. He's the God who is and who is to come. My God, shout Daphne, Alabama. You serve a healer. He's not El Chipo, he's El Shaddai. And he's still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord. We were, I'm trying to get to this baptism. Please sit. We were having a baptism service. Sister Pat, his wife, was getting her teeth, her feet washed. Her teeth. Her feet were getting washed and her teeth flew out in the foot washing bowl. The women started screaming and the brothers thought it was the Holy Ghost and we went into a three night revival. I tell you, that's the vineyard I was raised in. Oh, you, you're so narrow-minded. Oh, we feel so sorry for you. You never tasted the world. Don't you feel sorry for me? I didn't have an STD when I got married. I was still a virgin. I'm thankful to God for his keeping power. And you just, just take care of the vineyard you're in. Hallelujah. We're wine people. Sometimes we take a drink of this living water 
The writer of Hebrews in the sixth chapter says that it's this. It's tasting the power of the world that is to come. Isn't God good? That you can be living right here in the nasty now and he'll pull from heaven a drink of new wine and let you taste a small Of all the drinks you've had of living water and new wine, I want you to know nothing can compare to what it will be when we get over yonder. I've, Lord, if I take off preaching about heaven, I may not come back. We've stopped preaching about heaven because too many people think that we're going to live down here forever. Well, I want to tell you something. I'm coming back to this renewed earth one day, but I'm coming back with a new body, and I'm coming back with immortality, and I want you to know no matter how hard you and you should work, and we should advance the kingdom, and we should occupy until he comes, but he's coming, and when he comes, I'm thankful that there won't be a camp reward over yonder. I'm thankful there will not be a suicide room over yonder. I'm thankful that there will not be a sick place over yonder. Over yonder we will not even need the sun to shine in the sky because the Lamb of God will be the light of that city and we will drink the wine of the kingdom while the ages roll. I think we ought to warm up right now. I think we ought to praise him for the reality, the promise, the goodness of the inheritance and the promise that we have one day this mortal will put on immortality. One day this corrupt will put on incorruption. We will live forever with the king of glory. We're, please be seated. We're people of the wine. Well, we want people to understand what's happening when they come to our church. I don't. I am just fine with people leaving wondering. Well, I don't know, is that, by, oh yeah, the Bible said Jesus would perform miracles and it would stupefy the crowd. Who is this? Who even the winds and the waves obey him? We've never heard anything like what he said before. He would leave them in awe and wonder. We are so committed to answering the questions that sometimes they need to wrestle with. And is there anything more nauseating and unnecessary than a man trying to explain God to humanity? As if God needs an explainer. I mean, people get under conviction and we say, well, now what that is is religious guilt. No, 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 no. I need Jesus. Tell me where he's at. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're speaking in tongues and we don't understand. They're having a psychological ecstasy. You don't know the half of it. We're so, we have such a need to be understood that we have removed the supernatural wonder. Shh. Shh. I feel the Holy Ghost coming in this room. Strengthen us, Lord. There's some things that are supposed to happen in our church services that defy explanation. Jesus is okay with it. He's okay with you and I having to work through the wine and the questions that we have. They said, these men are drunk. The, the church, I'm trying to get back to my introduction so I can finish it and get to the sermon. <laughs> but when the Holy Ghost is poured out in the church's birth in Acts chapter 2, they say, these men are drunk. They don't say, these men are sophisticated. <laughs> Why do they say these men are drunk? Because they look drunk. They're stumbling around talking in languages that their teachers did not teach them. How can they do that? How can a man from Persia hear a man from the Medes speaking in Persian and no one understands how to? Because the Holy Ghost owns the languages. I have a brother-in-law, Gary Keelan, who's a dynamic evangelist. 
He is as hee-haw as hillbilly. <laughs> he was born in Ten Mile. That tells you anything. Ten Mile, you got a pipe sunshine in. I was with him in a service one night, and a group of Indians, I believe they were Choctaw Indians from a reservation, had come to our church to worship the Lord. And he starts speaking in tongues, and suddenly he starts speaking in native Choctaw. And the Choctaw chief walked up to me and said, my God, he's talking in a language that we speak. Does he know Choctaw? I said, he don't even hardly know English. I said, what is he saying in Choctaw? He said, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. I'm telling you, this Holy Spirit wine is real. You can think we're crazy if you want to, but the fastest growing group in Christianity is not a bunch of deadheads and knots on a log who are sitting up singing three dead songs, preaching a dead sermon, raising up dead deacons and dead elders. No, no, no. The most fastly growing group of Christianity in the earth are the tongue-talking, spirit-baptized, wine drinking Pentecostals who are fed up with religion and want another drink of the glory. Look at your neighbor, tell them we're people of wine. Which is why this text I read to you disturbs me. Because in order to have wine, you gotta have a vineyard. Vineyards produce grapes, and grapes produce wine. Depending on which study you read, about 20 pounds of grape are needed to produce a gallon of wine. Getting wine is not easy. It requires tending and stewarding a vineyard. We want cheap wine today, but the good stuff takes a while. In order for us to have wine, we have to preserve and tend and steward the vineyard God gave us. And the text before us today says that a man in leadership came to a man who owned a vineyard and said, I want your vineyard. Now, I think Ahab, at least in this revelation that I'm preaching and in this message God gave me, Ahab represents leadership of any kind that comes after the vineyard. It could be governmental leadership. Oh, Lord, here we go. Uh, is this on TV? I don't care. I'm just making sure I know who's coming for me if I say this. I know they're going... Government is not God. And they better stop trying to play God. We don't serve government, we serve God. It could be cultural leaders, sports stars, music icons. It could even be spiritual leadership. But in this text today, Ahab comes to Naboth and says, you have a vineyard and I want it. And what is especially concerning to me is the desire that Ahab the leader has to possess the vineyard and change its intended use. He has no regard for the antiquity, for the authenticity, for the longevity, for the history of that vineyard. He has completely disregarded all of the grapes that have grown there over the years, all the wine that has been produced. He actually confesses to Naboth I only want this vineyard because it's convenient to my house. I am terribly convinced in this hour, if we're not careful, we will give our vineyard away out of the name of convenience. 
many churches have placed a priority on convenience and we have we have begun to adopt this mentality in the church that the God we serve is a God of microwave blessing and sometimes some things have to be marinated a while. I want to tell you when I talk about being people of the wine, I'm about to lose some of you right here because what I'm getting ready to say, as true as it is, it is heartbreaking to people who want to rush the real thing. I want to tell you this, wine takes time. You've got to tend it and steward it and trim it and prune it. You've got to fertilize it and water it. You've got to make sure that it's not rotten and diseased. You've got to keep the bugs out of the vineyard and you've got to keep the vineyard pure and you've got to keep it free from contamination and you've got to make sure that you're, you're developing the root system and after harvest you've got to go back and you've got to pour more fertilizer on the root. It just is a big deal. And for some people, tending the vineyard has become too much. And they just say, maybe it's time to sell this vineyard. And if you're willing to sell it, the enemy is always willing to send somebody with a price. Naboth standing in the vineyard, the text says, of his father's. And the king comes to him and says, I want this piece of property out of the name of convenience. And Naboth said, the Lord forbid. Amen. That's the Wallace unauthorized translation of saying, you must be out of your mind. <laughs> to you, it looks like another piece of property. To you, it looks like another building on the side of the road. To you, it's just another group of people socializing and coming together. And some would even say, we're just a tad crazy. But to us who have tasted the wine of this vineyard, we say, God forbid. <laughs> that I would trade this vineyard for another what Ahab said. The first thing he said is, I'll give you another vineyard. Yeah. And when he sees the look on Naboth's face, like, yeah. it's just my imagination, but bear with me. He says, I'll give you another vineyard. And Naboth goes, okay, how about I pay you for it? Because money talks. Oh, yeah, it does. Don't look at me funny. You know money talks. That's why preachers are leaving their calling and they're entering careers. Because money talks, and they, they don't want to fight no more. They don't want to war no more. They don't want to tend the vineyard no more. They don't want to wrestle through the, the wrestling match of ministry. They get hurt. They get betrayed. They go through hell and high water, and it'd be a whole lot. My family is attacked. My mind is attacked. My physical body is attacked. It'd be a whole lot easier to sell this vineyard. Somebody in here listening to me and somebody watching me online, you are this close to signing a contract to sell your vineyard. I'm preaching this to intercept that foul lie of the enemy. What's the price? Naboth, what do you want for this vineyard? And Naboth said, God forbid that I should sell or give away. Listen, the inheritance of my fathers. Can I tell you something about this vineyard? It's not even yours. A generation before us tended this vineyard. Listen, and one coming after us needs it. Well, it doesn't really matter if I drop the ball and I sell the vineyard, if I cash out and, and if I get the life I want all in the name of convenience, all in the name of ease, all in the name of I'm, I'm just kind of wore out with this thing. I don't know if it takes all of that in church. I'm not sure that it demands all of this wine talk. Can we not just be normal? You will never be normal in the kingdom of God. In fact, you are meant to be abnormal, and we've gotten so subnormal, if we ever get normal, everybody's going to think we're abnormal. Yeah. 
Let me buy it from you. I want to buy the vineyard. And I want... The fool actually confessed what he was going to do. I'm going to turn your vineyard into a vegetable garden. I'm going to preach right here. I, I might as well. I'm getting on a plane after this sermon, and y'all ain't going to be able to find me. Hallelujah. We got people who don't want the wine. They want watered-down religion, and they don't want vineyards. They want vegetable gardens. Nobody says, come check out my vineyard. But we have people all the time, come check out what I'm growing. Let, let me show you what I grew. Let me show you how big my watermelon is. Let me show you how big my pumpkins are. Let me show you how great my green beans are. We are growing vegetable gardens, and God never called us to have a competition and a contest about how big our vegetable garden has become. We are not here to grow vegetable gardens. We are here to grow grapes because grapes are necessary for wine. And if we're going to have what the world needs, it's more than a dose of vegetables let me preach here there's just a handful of times that this Hebrew word is used when it says I want to grow a vegetable garden when, when Ahab said I want to grow a vegetable garden this is a very unique phrase found only a few times in all the Bible and one of the only other times it's mentioned it is in the 11th chapter of Deuteronomy the 10th verse where God said through the prophet Moses I brought you out of Egypt and the land that I am taking, listen to me very carefully. This is in Deuteronomy 11.10. He said, I brought you out of Egypt, and the land that I am taking you to is a land flowing with milk and with honey. Here, 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 here it goes. It is not a land like Egypt where you used your foot to dig your garden and grow vegetables. Same Hebrew word. What does that mean, drag your foot? Here's what they did in Egypt. They irrigated their own vegetables and they would take their foot and drag it through tilled soil so that water would come and fill the rut that they had created with their foot and they grew their garden and they used Egypt's water and the Israelite people learned how to, to, to develop a garden that they had the ability to sustain and grow on their own. When God brought them out of Egypt, he said, this is not going to be like Egypt. In Egypt, you drug your foot. You created your own field. You created your own harvest. But I'm taking you into a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And instead of you having to drag your foot and build a garden, you're going to have to live right, obey my word. And if you do, I'll open the heavens and I'll pour down rain and I'll water vineyards you didn't plant and I'll give you harvest you could have never purchased. I'll bless you coming. My God, I feel like preaching. I'll bless you coming. In, I'll bless you going out. I'm going to bless your children. I'm going to bless your business. I'm going to bless what you put your hands on. I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. I'm going to make you above and not beneath. That's why I don't understand why we've got long faces and frowning faces. We are the redeemed of the Lord. We are the head and we're not the tail. He brought us out of Egypt not to take us into bondage, but to deliver us from the taskmaster Pharaoh. If the sun sets us free, we are free. Indeed, life is about to get better for the redeemed. Do you know what they ate in Egypt? The vegetables they ate? Leeks and onions. Ahab is literally saying, I'm going to take your vineyard and I'm going to make it what you had when we were in Egypt. It's called religion. Religion is always looking back and going backwards. How many of y'all going to drive home? Some of you might Uber or I don't know. Maybe you have a bicycle that this doesn't apply to, but most of you are going to drive. When you get in your car to drive, you may temporarily look in the rearview mirror to back up, but you don't drive home looking in the rearview mirror. Because where you're going is not in your past. Where you're going has to be seen through the windshield and you gotta keep looking. Listen, I need to tell this house, I need to tell somebody listening to me online right now, you must stop looking back. Well, you know, back then I know how to drag my foot and make it happen. I know, but we're not in those days anymore. We need a fresh outpouring of rain because the vineyard God has called us to tend has to have an outpouring of rain. 
And I want to tell you, I, I'm almost done here, but I came to Daphne to, say, to tell you this. I feel there is a 100% chance of rain. It's about to rain on your field. God help me preach. Holy Ghost, thank you. I wish you would break the yoke over your neighbor's mind and lean over and tell your neighbor right now, your field is about to get rained on. It's about to rain on your field. In fact, I feel a prophetic thing getting on me right now. I feel the Holy Ghost telling me to tell somebody, dry seasons are over. Dry seasons are over. Famine is coming to an end. Your vineyard has been dry. You've been wondering, your vineyard has been dry, but I hear the Holy Ghost saying, dry seasons are over. This famine has an expiration date. This drought is coming to an end. The Bible said Elijah prayed that it would not rain, and it rained not for three and one half years, but he prayed again, and the heavens yielded the rain. I tell you, somebody's been praying. Clouds the size of a man's hand are forming. Shout like your field is about to get rained on. It's going to rain in the Netherlands. It's going to rain in India. It's going to rain in Mobile. It's going to rain in Shakotabatandalabosie. It's going to rain. Let the devil worry, howl, and hiss. Let hell be defeated. Let the heavens give forth the rain, the former and the latter rain. Well, I don't feel it. Take your umbrella down. Dance in the rain. Shout in the rain. God, sit with me. I'm almost done. God forbid that I should give this vineyard the inheritance of my father's it was given to me by my fathers and must be preserved for my sons. I don't have time to go there, but Miss Lydia, you were talking about a younger generation and my Holy Ghost, inside, I just started feeling that. I don't need my children to be 20 before they encounter glory. Because if you wait till they're 20, till you introduce them to the Holy Ghost, the world has already introduced this antichrist agenda to their mind. My God, we've got school systems now that find it appropriate to tell our sons and daughters that you can change your gender and not even tell your mom and dad, oh, you're just over there howling and talking about crazy stuff. I'm telling you that the image of God is being attacked in our generation. And except the preachers of this nation open up their mouth, cry aloud and spare not living your voice like a trumpet. I am not some narrow-minded bigot. I am a father who loves sons and daughters, and I have to deal with the aftermath of those who have heard the voice of a perverse spirit tell them God didn't know what he was doing when you were created. The devil is a liar. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are made in the image of God. This, this vineyard that God has given us is not just from our fathers, it's for our sons and daughters. And Naboth says, it's not for sale. Do you understand he could have made a lot more money and had a not lot a whole lot nicer life. But this vineyard is not for sale. This move of God. Have you ever been attacked for sake? Maybe you don't deal with these crazy people like I have to sometimes. They say, there is no such thing as the move of God. <laughs> Find it in the Bible. Okay, sister, yay, yay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Wait, 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 wait. And the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God, I like your spirit. The spirit of God. 
moved on the waters. I want to tell you that that same brooding spirit is not sitting in some far removed corner of heaven, sitting on a couch, having a psychiatric treatment because of what the devil is doing in our generation. That same Bakandaho, Brehesh Ketebe, Satarabohosa, that same Holy Spirit is brooding over Daphne, Alabama this morning. He's moving the width and the breadth of this city. He's moving the breadth and the width of India. I tell you this Holy Ghost is on the move. It's not for sale. So let me end this message because I'm going to be honest with you. I, I had a real good feeling about the first part of this message. I, I knew I heard the Lord. But the more I read in this text, the more bothered I got until God began to give me revelation. Because if you read the story after what I stopped reading, Ahab goes home and pouts. What a pathetic leader. I didn't get my way. And he goes home and he finds Jezebel. And she looks at him and says, why are you sullen and displeased? And he said, because I went to Naboth and he told me I could not have his vineyard. And she taunts him. She said, oh, leader king. She devises a demonic, diabolical strategy, a false accusation, and she brings Naboth to a party where they level accusations against him and two debased, lying scums of the earth. Why not one? Because in the Old Testament, you can never condemn a man for being guilty with just one witness. There must be two. But how depraved is the society where you can't just find one who will bring a false accusation. They're so full of evil, they'll start talking about how they're gonna contrive a lie. Y'all don't want me to go here, I can tell. And they lie on Naboth. These two scoundrels stand up, read the text later, 1 Kings 21. They stand up at this celebration of sorts and they say, he blasphemed God, spoke evil against the king. And without even looking for the evidence or surveying the balance of the people who were in the room, this man of integrity who had preserved and stewarded the vineyard is brought up on false charges, falsely accused, lied on. It's amazing how many people in the church are looking for lies on leaders. Don't shout yet. Let me tell you, this thing is getting ready to be exposed. And the people that have really been doing this, the evil behind the scenes, God's about to jerk the cover off of them. Oh, yeah. Who are you talking? I'm talking about the ones who are doing evil behind the scenes. You don't have to read into my words. I'm telling you what's been hidden is about to be revealed. And those who are full of lies and false accusations are going to be exposed. And without a proper trial, they take him out to the edge of the city and they stone Naboth. And he dies. And you are sitting here saying, why did he finish this message with that bit of truth? Because nobody wants to die. And I came to tell you, I'd rather die than live and give away my vineyard. This vineyard is not for sale. Well, it might cost me something. It might cost you everything. But the vineyard is worth it all. It's the inheritance of the fathers and the future of our sons. And we've got to stop selling out because it's convenient. 
Let me tell you something. You know the fact of the matter is you can't kill a man that's already dead. Amen. Oh, they killed Naboth. Naboth was already a dead man. How does so? He was dead to self. He was dead to pride. He was dead to being bought out. There are some things worth dying for. And we've missed that in the church. This is why we have in America, we don't understand places like Pakistan where spiritual daughters of mine text me every week, message me every week. Bishop, cover us in prayer. They hate us and they're trying to kill us. And they're over in China having secret church underground. And we come to America and got to beg people to praise the Lord. It's because we're not willing to die for the vineyard anymore. We think that church is about us feeling comfortable and cozy. There are some things that are so hard Holy and real, they're worth dying for. But I was praying this morning. I woke up early. I was praying. I said, God, help me understand what you're saying in this text. Can, Lydia, can you come help me, dear? And the Lord began to help me see something. How many have ever been to a prayer meeting and heard a whole lot of praying against Jezebel? Come on, don't lie. I've done it. I've had fasts, personal fasts, where I fasted against the spirit of Jezebel working against my life. Do you understand something? That what brought judgment to Jezebel was not the prayer meetings and the pulling down and the casting down of the spirit of Jezebel. Nothing wrong with that, I do it. But do you know what brought judgment to Jezebel? her attack against a godly man who would not sell the vineyard. And here's what I heard the Holy Ghost whisper to me in prayer this morning. I'm about to judge Jezebel, not because of how much you've been praying against her, but I'm about to bring judgment against that spirit for all of the innocent blood she shed and all of the preachers she ran out of the ministry and all of the attacks against the preacher's family. I'm not telling you God hasn't heard your prayer. I'm just telling you what moved the heart of God to judge that wickedness was the innocence and the purity of a man who would not sell the vineyard. And God is about to stand up for men and women of God. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. That demonic, do you think Jezebel is a woman you haven't read your Bible? She is one of the few people who find herself in the Old Testament and in the new. Her tentacles of destruction and diabolical evil weave themselves from 1 Kings all the way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Pauline epistles, general epistles, Jude, and even in Revelation, she is still working. Do you know what church she's working in in Revelation chapter 2? Thyatira. Do you know what Thyatira? Go check me later when you get home, not now. Google will give you revelation on this. Thyra Tyra was known for two things, their purple fabric and their wine. What church does she show up in? The church of the wine. And what is she doing in Thyra Tyra? She's shacking up when the Sunday school teachers seducing the teachers of God's word. And here's what Jesus, I didn't say this, John didn't say this, Jesus said this. You have tolerated her. And the Holy Ghost gave me a revelation this morning. Everywhere we're binding Jezebel, let me tell you this, she will only operate where she has been tolerated. The Greek word for tolerate is eao. Eao. It means to permit. In other words, the leader of the church of Thyatira permitted that spirit to work. And when you permit it to work, even though it died in the Old Testament, your ability, you give it ability to resurrect and manifest when you permit it to work in your house. That's why breaking the spirit of Jezebel doesn't take 17 weeks. It's, it only takes a leader who says, you are not permitted in this house. 
I don't care if Jezebel's wearing a dress, a skirt, a mini skirt, a three-piece suit, a bishop, a bishop's robe. I don't care what they got on. If it is manipulating, if it is diabolical, if it is controlling, and if it is seductive, somebody with spiritual authority has got to stand up and point to that spirit and say, you are not permitted here. And I want to tell you something. Ready? Stand. I'm through. Jezebel is dead and Jesus is alive. That might be all I need to say right there. Jezebel is dead and Jesus is alive. And let me tell you something about Uncle Naboth. He's doing all right right now in the presence of the Lord. And he's in heaven with God and he's standing there saying, I'm, I know I died, but I'm glad that I did not sell the vineyard because thousands of years later, we're still standing in Daphne, Alabama, drinking new wine because somebody would not sell. This, somebody praise the Lord if you believe this vineyard is not for sale.